Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you're trained so well. It's not even children's moment, you know what to do. It's just a good day. Well, welcome to First Christian Church on this lovely holiday weekend. And especially since the preacher's away and typically the cats will play, I give you all credit for being here. So definitely check that box for attendance. If you are joining us for the first time or you're a visitor, please make sure that you fill out one of these cards that are in the pews and just place it in the offering glass basket so we know who you are. Welcome. Good morning. Godspeed. Once more, good morning. Would you rise if you're able and join me in the responsive call to worship? For the joy and inspiration of worship, <laughs> for the deepening of faith within this community of Christians, for the strength to endure the hard places of life, for the courage to face the unknown future. The Lord will provide. Let, Let us worship the Lord. Please remain standing as we sing our hymn of praise. <laughs> God's message is a still, small voice, not a trumpet or brass band. Truth sits quietly while ignorance shouts. Let us take the time to really know what we need to hear and to whom we should listen. We come here to seek to be more like Jesus. 
We ask you for the wisdom to find what we are seeking and to know when we find it. Amen. Today's first scripture reading is from Genesis 22, 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The word of God for the people of God. Please send or bring the children up for the children's moment. This morning, I'm going to read for you the scripture first, and then we're going to get into the children's. And there's Annie, my favorite ex-neighbors. I miss them. The scripture is from Matthew. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to the little ones in the name of the of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose every reward. 
Guys, I've got something here. When y'all used to come over to my house, when Tigger wasn't out and chasing Eli away, because Tigger's my mean cat, what was on my, in front of my front door? Was it something like this? Yeah. It was, wasn't it? But it had flowers or... I have another cat now, too. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And you still have two dogs at your house, don't you? Yeah. So, so what does this say? Does it say welcome? What, would, what do you think it means? Oh, come on back, Eli. What would you, if you were to come into the house, my house and see my turtle, would you wipe your feet? And would I say, welcome, come in, let me get you a popsicle? I would, wouldn't I? Because I wanted you to feel welcome at my house. And Anna, when you come to somebody's house, do you feel welcome if they have a mat in the front? Or do you, if you saw one that said, go away, you wouldn't feel welcome, would you? Well, we want to welcome people into our house and into our church. And it doesn't matter if they are big or little, or if their skin's a different color, or if their clothes <coughs> look different from us. We want to welcome them, don't we? Do we do that all the time? No, sometimes we are tired and we want to take a nap or we just don't want to be welcoming. But we want to try because Jesus told us to be welcoming. And when we welcome somebody, it's like welcoming him, right? So we want to try our best to be welcoming to everybody that comes in our church to be friendly to them, okay? Let's say a prayer. Welcome and learn. Dear Lord, please help us learn to be welcoming to all who enter our lives so that we may treat them as Jesus would. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> This is our time and our service when we have our time of community prayer. We share our joys and our concerns with one another. And um, I would like to share with you that um, earlier we were told that Don Whitney died last night. And so we definitely want to keep his family in our prayers during this time of loss. And as details are made related to the service, we will try to let the congregation know as soon as we're able to. And also, um, we received word this weekend that Cheryl Wells' brother was killed in an automobile accident last Friday. So we need to keep Cheryl and her family in our prayers related to the death of her brother, Mike. And as Jillian's already said, our uh, J Jacob and his family, are there. this is his vacation time right now, so we want to um, pray that he'll have a good time away and that this will be renewing and refreshing for Jacob and for his family. And I think we also want to have to pray for safe travels for those who are traveling on this holiday weekend, extended weekend time. Are there other joys or concerns that people would like to share with us during this time? We invite you to raise your hand or indicate that you have something to share with us. Okay, well, seeing none, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious, loving God, we turn to you, rejoicing in your grace and mercy that you extend to us each day. We are thankful that you are our rock and the foundation of our lives. We place our trust in your steadfast love. And we also ask that you will help us to be your obedient disciples as we seek to follow the path that Jesus led. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy this day as we come to worship and share in the celebration of this Christian community. 
We pray that you will give us hope for the journey as we respond to your call to serve others. We pray for our nation, that we might be a nation that will use our resources in ways that will honor you. We ask that you will bind us together and heal our brokenness so that we might truly become your faithful disciples, extending kindness and justice to all people. We offer our prayers and our lives to you as we unite together praying the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
we come to this table to celebrate God's love in our midst. We come with the assurance that as we break the bread and share the cup, we are united together as one body in Christ. We come bringing all that we are. We come bringing our joys, our sorrows, our struggles, and our celebrations. We come knowing that God is with us through all of life, that nothing can ever separate us from God's loving care given in Christ Jesus. Let us prepare our hearts to receive the bread and the cup as we're led in prayer by our elders. Let us pray. May we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the privilege to come to this table. And as this, we come to the table, may we be ever mindful of what it represents. The bread, the broken body of Jesus, our Lord. Dear Lord, help us to be and live a more pleasing life for you. In your name we pray, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here together, we are so thankful that you have filled our souls by shedding your blood for all of us. Help us to open our hearts so that we welcome all who want to come and be a part and partake of this meal we share at the Lord's table. Fill us with goodness and kindness and grace and love so that when we come to the end of our days, we will also be able to say, it is well, it is well with our souls. Amen. We come because Christ has invited us to come. We come knowing that because Christ has invited us, all are welcome. When Jesus gathered with those in the upper room, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. In like manner, he blessed the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant which is given for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink of this often in remembrance of me.
cup of salvation given for you. As we have received so abundantly from God, this is our opportunity to give back, to give back out of gratitude and out of thankfulness for all that we have, given, we have received from God. Let us give so that the ministry of this church can continue to spread the good news of God's love throughout the world. Let us give freely and generously as we receive our morning offerings. As we offer our treasure and hearts to you, O oh God, may they be used to pass on the promise of hope, of peace, of life, of community to all in need of your gifts and presence in their lives. Amen. Our second scripture reading is listed in your bulletin as being Matthew 10, 40 through 42, but unfortunately, I changed my mind <laughs> after the bulletins were printed. So instead, we're going to continue on with Genesis uh, chapter 22, verses 15 through 20. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. The word of the Lord.
ready? I don't know if I am. <laughs> um, in, on Thursday mornings, the ministry staff gets together and we have a meeting. And about a month ago, um, at a rather bold moment, I offered to give the message today in Jacob's absence. 
I was rather excited and thought, what great to practice for me, and had visions of knocking it out of the park, as my son would say. And all was well until I checked the scripture for today. Now, let me just say, I think there must be weeks that ministers take off on purpose, just so they don't have to preach on certain verses in the Bible. Wink, wink. So as I was saying, there it was, staring me in the face, Abraham and Isaac, quite possibly one of my least favorite stories in the Bible. I began to panic and I broke out in a cold sweat. And all I could think of was how in the world am I going to preach on being willing to sacrifice my only son? Because guess what? I'm not willing. I am ashamed to admit it. My faith does not run that deep. I cannot, cannot imagine God testing me in such a way. And why would he? Isn't there some better way to show one's devotion? So after mild heart palpitations, I figured I could speak on growing one's faith and how to accomplish that. However, when I finally got down to it and started the work of studying and reading and praying over the text, putting the time in, I kept seeing and hearing the same word, obedience. And that too is very difficult for me. A man was walking up a narrow path on the side of a cliff and he wasn't paying close attention to his footing and suddenly he slipped and he went right over the edge. And as he fell, he grabbed a hold of a branch that was hanging from the side of the cliff and realizing that he couldn't hang on for long, he called up for help. Hey, is anybody up there? A voice answers, sir, yes, I'm here. And the man says, who's that? The voice says, God. God, can you help me? Do you trust me? I trust you completely, God. Good. Let go of the branch. What? I said, let go of the branch. And the man answers after a long pause. Um, hey, is anybody else up there? So like this dangling cliffhanger, are you ever afraid that God might ask too much of you? Consider for a moment what would be too much to ask. Our daily lives are built around people and things we enjoy. A spouse, children, friends, a job, a hobby, possessions, and even future plans. These people and things are the foundations of our support system. And if one of them is removed, we sometimes feel as though the very foundation of our lives is collapsing underneath us. But there are times when God says, let go. And the mortar that holds that foundation together suddenly crumbles. If you've ever been in that situation, you know the pressure a test like that can exert on your faith. And Abraham was well acquainted with such tests. And Genesis 22's test is one of the greatest crises of the Bible. So after much studying, complaining, reading, soul searching, and more study, I have come to the conclusion that Abraham's crisis was a crisis of obedience. And it comes in three parts through our text today. The first is the test of obedience, then the commitment of obedience, and finally, the blessings of obedience. The first part is the test of obedience, which is verses one through eight. It begins with the phrase, now it came after these things. This takes us back over Abraham's pilgrimage of faith. During these years, Abraham encountered several tests. Some he passed with flying colors, and others he failed at miserably. Abraham was quite human, just like you and me. Yet despite a mixture of success and failure, God wanted to grow Abraham and use his life powerfully. We all have had our share of success, but we've also experienced some failures along the way, just as Abraham did. You need to know that in the midst of the failures, God has not discarded you, nor is he finished with you. In fact, 
He wants to take you to the next level, to grow you, and he does this through tests. The next phrase is, God tested Abraham. The word test still conjures up nightmares for me. We all have been through the stress of tests in school, and I can remember clearly sitting in class staring at that one problem worth 10 points whose answer completely escaped me. Real tests take place over the course of our lives, and in some of these tests, whether we pass or fail is of the utmost importance. We need to keep two things in mind here. God tests to confirm and strengthen. In the New Testament, James let us know that God was testing Abraham so his faith could be perfected before men. That's James 2.22. The word perfect means complete or mature. Persevering through tests and being obedient to God made Abraham's faith visible to an onlooking world. God tested Abraham in order to give him an opportunity to display his true character. He will do the same for you. Every test God brings into your life is an opportunity for you to shine and to grow. This should be exciting to you. Even if spiritual tests are difficult, they have a wonderful purpose, to grow you, to make it so the world can see God's greatness revealed in you. Now, we need to be aware that Abraham had walked with God for about 35 years before God tested him in such an extreme way. God did not give him this test until he knew Abraham was equipped for it. One of the great things about God is that he does not give us tests we cannot pass. His tests come when we are prepared. Furthermore, he supplies an extra measure of grace to help us through times of testing. 1 Corinthians verse 10, chapter 10, verse 13 says, No testing has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tested, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God is not like some of our former teachers who gave pop quizzes on information they had never covered in class. God is gracious and faithful. He wants for us not only to pass said test, but to earn the highest grade possible. We are told from the very first verse in this chapter that Abraham will be tested. Notice when God calls Abraham's name, Abraham responds with, here I am. He is willing to hear from God and be moved to action. God wants us to be faithful, available, and teachable. Do those characteristics define who you are? Sometimes people and things can become too important to us. We grip them with closed fists and white knuckles. So God has to literally pry open our very fingers to loosen our hold. This is not ideal. So I ask you, are you in the midst of a test? Is something that is important to you at risk of being taken away from you? A relationship, a job, a dream, your finances? Whatever it may be, don't let God take it from you. Give it to him. The Lord speaks again in verse 2. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. This verse is not made up of a series of gracious requests. Instead, God gives three commands, take, go, and offer, and offers them without explanation. Abraham was not simply to wound his son, bandage him up, and merrily go on their way. Abraham was told to offer his son as a burnt offering. Seriously? That must be horrific. In verses 3 and 4, we see that Abraham obeyed God's commands immediately and unquestioningly. We read that Abraham rose early in the morning. Now, 
If I had been Abraham, I would have spent at least two days agonizing, doubting, hoping for another answer, praying again, and probably, probably begging God to change his mind. Then I would have talked things through with my husband, maybe put it on Facebook, seeking advice, and then I would finally have sought out my wisest elder, friend, and pastoral counsel that was available to me. Psalm 119.60 says, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. That's not me, but that was Abraham. He obeyed. Scripture does not say, but I think his decision to get up early may have had more to do with a tortured soul than eagerness. Abraham saddled his donkey and also split wood for the burnt offering. This is a man who is over 100 years old and has numerous servants. What was he thinking? My guess is he probably trying to occupy his, was probably trying to occupy his mind and stay busy so he wouldn't have to think about what lay ahead. Yet in spite of all of this, he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. What is even more unbearable is that he could not finish the deed quickly. He was given time to think about what lay ahead. It was a three-day journey from Beersheba to Moriah, 50 miles. Three days in which to think about what he must do. This was all a part of the test of obedience. In verses 5 through 8, we see that Abraham's obedience was based on faith. After knowing his destination, Abraham spoke. He instructed his servants to stay behind with his donkey. So why didn't Abraham bring the servants up the mountain with him? Because he knew his servants would try to stop him. They would have kept him from placing Isaac on that altar. They would have concluded that he had lost his mind and would have tried to restrain him for his own good. Granted, they would have been doing this out of ignorance. Nevertheless, they would have, without a doubt, attempted to foil God's plan for Abraham. We must use the same wisdom Abraham did. If we want to be faithful followers, then we must be diligent in removing every obstacle. Sometimes we are faced with decisions that are difficult, like cutting people out of our lives that keep us from faith-filled living. Do you know what I mean? Ooh. Nobody's nodding. Okay, I got two. Good job. <laughs> we must diligently evaluate our friendships because some will lead us in the wrong direction. Sometimes effective discipleship means you have to start with subtraction and even decisions or the cutting out. Another test of obedience is are you willing to do whatever you can to walk with God? Don't miss the last phrase in verse 5. We will worship and return to you. Abraham is saying, God told me to go kill my son, but we are coming back. He was prepared to kill Isaac, burn his body as an offering, and then watch God raise him up off the altar. Why? because he believed God was able. Now, I'm sure he must have been praying his heart out, but he was obedient in the midst of great despair. Abraham's response is rather remarkable when you realize that God's command was illogical. From every human viewpoint, it was contradictory and inconsistent. In Hebrews 11, lines 17 through 19, God had promised Abraham he would establish his covenant with Isaac, and it was to be an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So at the ripe old age of 100, Abraham became a father, and now God wants to take his son? This doesn't make sense. Yet Abraham was obedient and did what contradicted logic. There will be times in your life when obedience will not make sense. Are you prepared to obey God even in these cases? I confess there are many things in the Bible that I wish were not there. Life would be easier. 
but the real test of surrender isn't when I obey commands I like. If I say to my children, eat your ice cream, that is not a good test of how well they obey me. The true test is when I ask them to do something difficult. If God is calling you to something difficult today, will you say, here I am? Will you obey? If God is calling you to let go of something today, will you? Abraham's test intensifies in lines six through eight when he has to take the wood of the burnt offering and lay it on his son. As Abraham and Isaac are trekking along, it dawns on Isaac that the most important element is missing. So Isaac finally breaks the silence and speaks to his dad. Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Can you imagine what went through Abraham's mind when Isaac asked that question? What could he say? Cure it. I love you, son, but I'm going to sacrifice you. Rather, Abraham replied, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Not only did his answer hide the truth from Isaac, it also demonstrated faith in God. What he is saying is, let's let God take care of it. I want to come to the place in my own life where I can confidently say, God is big enough to take care of me. If I'm faithful to obey him in all that he asks of me, he will provide for me all that I need. The only way this kind of obedience can be pulled off is by walking with God and knowing his heart and accepting his grace. Number two, the commitment of obedience. In lines nine and 10, Abraham's obedience was thorough and complete. The whole procedure is drawn out like a slow motion replay. It has taken three days to get to Moriah. Once Abraham finally arrives, he has to climb Mount Moriah. Then he has to build an altar, arrange the wood, bind his son, lay him on the altar, stretch out his hand, and take the knife to slay him. Now, on my very best spiritual day, I might have had the faith to build the altar, but definitely not to kill. Abraham did everything, yet heaven remained silent. I'm sure as he raised that knife, every bone in his body must have wanted to disobey. But if Abraham had not raised the knife, he would have not heard from God. Did you catch that? It took raising the knife of obedience with intent to kill. That's commitment. And then Abraham heard from God. Many of us may be willing to lay something on the altar, but when we do, we take along a rubber knife. Yet our obedience is not complete if there are some strings attached. One thing is very clear. Abraham could not have offered Isaac without Isaac's consent and cooperation. Isaac, as the bearer of the wood, was the stronger of the two. As a young man, he was also the faster of the two. Clearly, he was strong enough and big enough to resist or subdue his father. Apparently, Isaac had decided to obey his father whatever the cost, just as his father had decided to obey God at whatever the cost. At this point in our story, it is often our tendency to object to God's demands. We wonder why God wants such a sacrifice from us. We may ask ourselves, why does he want all of me? Well, God doesn't choose to share you. He wants all of you. Remember, total obedience is not only measured by what you give God. God also takes into account what you keep for yourself. Can God get close to the most important things in your life, your possessions, business, plans, and dreams, and relationships? Are you willing to let go? Luke 14, 26 and 27 says, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. 
Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Sometimes the supreme test of our faith will be a matter of putting obedience to God above something we have lived for all of our lives. Sometimes it will involve something that might seem to everyone else foolish and ridiculous. Are you willing to be sacrificially obedient to God in every area of your life? As Abraham's knife was raised to kill his son, something amazing happened. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. What a relief this must have been. Abraham must have wiped his tears and jumped for joy. The angel of the Lord tells Abraham that Isaac was spared because now I know that you fear God. This verse cannot mean that God learns just then that Abraham fears him as a result of Abraham's faithful actions with Isaac. For, the, for that would make God less than the one who was all-knowing. In Psalm 139, lines 1 through 4, the Bible instructs that God decrees all things and has done so before the creation of the universe. So certainly, he need not wait until Abraham is faithful in actions in order to know that Abraham fears God. The angel of the Lord is saying to Abraham, by your faithful actions, I experientially know that you fear God. I have witnessed such. So then we come to the blessings of obedience. We are blessed by obedience in three ways. First, God blesses us by providing the things which he demands of us. It is written, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord will provide. When Abraham demonstrated what he was willing to go, that he was willing to go all the way in his obedience to God, the Lord provided a solution to his crisis. Remember, God was testing Abraham. He didn't want the sacrifice of a son. He wanted the surrender of a father. So fittingly, Abraham named this place, the Lord will provide, Yahweh Yireh, or literally, the Lord will see. You know the cliche, the devil is in the details? Typically, people who are not detail-oriented like to use this line. However, if the devil is in the details, we are in trouble. Fortunately, in this verse, Abraham is saying God is the one who is in the details. He is the one who will see to it that everything is appropriately cared for. The name he chooses does not draw attention to himself, but to God. He does not name the place Abraham was obedient. He focuses on God's mercy and faithfulness, not on his own obedience. Abraham wanted there to be a record for Isaac. He wouldn't have any problem trusting God again. Here we see that God is both tester and provider. When God tests you, he will provide for you. What you release to God, he replaces with something even more valuable. Do you believe that? One more important note. If you're observant, which at first I was not, you may have noticed that Abraham says that God would provide a lamb for the burnt offering. However, it wasn't a lamb caught in the thicket, but a ram. The ram could not provide the once and for all sacrifice that Abraham prophetically spoke of in verse 8. That high calling was reserved for God's own son, Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time, 1 Timothy 2.6. He is our substitute, our Savior. The second part of the blessing of obedience is God blesses us by providing assurance of his promises. 
in lines 15 through 18, we have the final recorded incident, instance of God speaking to Abraham. God here says, by myself I have sworn, where he affirms the promises which he has already given to Abraham. God has to swear by himself because there is no one greater he can swear by. It is unusual for God to speak with an oath. Abraham's supreme act of obedience drew out God's supreme assurance of blessing. If you lack assurance of God's promises to you, obey him. He gives his greatest assurance to those who obey him most fully. We are not told whether or not God spoke to Abraham during his three-day journey to the mountain, but once he arrived and was performing the sacrifice, God spoke commanding Abraham to stay his hand and then again to give a word of promise. It is a good word. It is as though he told Abraham, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The third blessing of obedience, God blesses us by providing for our future needs. Our story ends with the news that Abraham's brother, Nahor, has become the father of 12 sons. They would later become the ancestors of 12 tribes. The central purpose of this, is to, of this list is to introduce the future bride of Isaac, Rebekah. No doubt Abraham had wondered where he would find a wife for Isaac so that his son would not be absorbed into the Canaanite culture. God had already taken care of that matter with Rebekah. When we obey God fully, we can trust that he is looking farther ahead than we are. He is already taking care, not only of our future needs, but also of the needs of our children. But please know that God has not promised Christians great physical blessings. But whenever we do sacrifice for him, our relationship grows deeper with him. For this reason, we should not fear making personal sacrifices for God or being obedient. God is always working in us. I read this recently in studying these verses. A nail would certainly question the value of a hammer. To the nail, the hammer is a cruel instrument. But what it doesn't see is that each blow forces the nail to bite deeper and hold more effectively. Without the hammer, the nail would not be effective. Tests are like the hammer. Sometimes they come suddenly and other times they appear over the passing of many months, slowly as the erosion of earth. Are you a nail that has begun to resent the blows of the hammer? Are you on the brink of despair, thinking that you cannot bear another day of testing? As difficult as it may be for you to believe this today, God knows what he's doing. Your savior knows your breaking point. The hammering process is designed to reshape you, not ruin you. Your value is increasing the longer he lingers over you. So I say, let's practice obedience. It's well worth the effort. As we seek to obey God in our lives, there are those here today who might want to respond to that by coming forward and making a confession of faith or uniting with this faith community by transfer of membership. So on behalf of this congregation, I invite anyone who would like to respond to that call to come forward as we stand and sing our hymn of commitment. Let us join together in praising God by standing in. Thank you. 